<clears throat> so good morning. It's a uh, great pleasure to be to be back at the Galileo Galilei Institute. Thank you so much for having me. It's a, a great place, and I so far a great meeting. Uh, so it's a meeting about horizons. So um, I'll say a few words about uh, the things we've been thinking about concerning uh, the physics of horizons, mostly testing the black hole paradigm, and I'll tell you what I mean by that in a few uh, minutes. So please feel free to interrupt me. I will repeat the question. Unlike uh, Rami, I'll make sure that people online will, will understand the question. So no need for a microphone. I'll just make sure that. Uh... OK, now I think we all understand that there's two reasons why we want to test horizons and why these are very exciting times to be discussing this. I think everybody repeats this mantra, but it is a, a true mantra. And there's two reasons for this. Uh, I will repeat what Rami said yesterday, but so that we're all in the same page. The first, of course, is uh, that whenever you have trapped surface formation, at least in classical general relativity with standard energy conditions, then something breaks down. Right, this is a, a famous result by Penrose that says whenever you have a trapped surface formation, one of those things is going to happen. Either matter goes berserk, or the Einstein equations are violated, or you, you even lose the meaning of a space time manifold. Therefore, uh, if we're going to state that you know, the universe is filled with uh, trillions of black holes, then we also need to understand that for each of those objects, something goes uh, failing in their interior. So I think we need to understand this because this is a strong reason why we want to test strong gravity, right? We want to test the near horizon region because something may be percolating from the inside. Of course, uh, the, the field equations need to be changed to deal with this uh, classical singularity. There's, there's attempts at uh, dealing with this, most notably the weak and strong version of the cosmic censorship. But I think it's important to understand that this is really just a conjecture that tries to save us uh, from the, uh, the, the failure of the field equations in black hole interiors. And by the way, there are known counterexamples to this conjecture. Most of them relate to the weak version of the cosmic censorship, meaning external observers having access to uh, regions of too stronger curvature. They really, they usually happen in, in higher dim uh, dimensions, but there are also known examples of the failure of the strong version of the conjecture and asymptotically the seater space-time. So space-times of cosmological interest. Okay, so I think it's a, a reason for concern that the partial differential equations of classical general relativity are not protecting us. Okay, I think it's an important point to be made. And I think also one reason to think about these issues. The second reason, of course, for anyone that thinks about black holes is that they are not afflicted by the, the usual uh, uncertainties. They're really, really simple objects. Right? In classical general relativity, asymptotically flat vacuum black hole solutions, <clears throat> they need to belong to the Kerr family. The Kerr family, let me repeat this because I think I might use this again. It's parameterized by two quantities, the mass M and the angular momentum A. I'm setting Newton's constant and the speed of light to one in all of the things I do, okay? And an alternative way of stating the same uh, thing is to say that all the multiples, all the multiple moments of the curved geometry are specified by just these two parameters. And I wrote down the mass and current multiples there. Okay. It is a, so the question is that this is not a theorem. It is, yeah, the regular syntactically flat vacuum black hole solution of the field equations apart a minor technical uh, thing which is too technical for me this is a theorem this is proven 
And I think the latest version, you can see the living reviews by Grusiel and Costa. This is a, a theorem, okay? This is vacuum. Of course, there are a couple of known counterexamples. You, you can take a scalar field, and if you have rotation, then you have uh, hairy solutions. You can take some type of fluids. You can also build, of, of course, molecules that are in galaxies, and we, you know, we see matter. But in vacuum, this is a, a theorem. And so, because they are so simple, it's relatively easy to put this statement to the test. Okay, not trivial, but at least it's a, a very good starting point. Uh, and because I'll use this as a starting point, let me also tell you in a couple of minutes what happens when you sprinkle uh, a space time like this with point particles and you see how they move. Of course, far away, you can have planets and stars orbiting on stable motion. It's really you just recover Newtonian physics. But as you move inwards, you start seeing the relativistic effects of uh, general relativity. The first one is that you stop having stable motion sufficiently close to a compact object, right? There's, the, uh, there's always the existence of an innermost stable orbit. And this is also a good observational uh, signature of, of black holes or, or very compact objects. You, you, you're, you're looking out there and suddenly you're, uh, you're truncate your luminous uh, emission. There should be a region where nothing happens because there, there is no matter. As you move inwards, as you continue moving inwards, there's another region which is very special, which is the, uh, the photon sphere or the light ring. So if you, if you go to this region and you shoot this laser beam in a, well, you fine tune the angle of this laser beam, the laser beam might hit you in the back of your head. Okay, so there's a, uh, uh, there's a closed trajectory for photons. It's an unstable motion. So the photon either falls onto the, uh, the central object or then it scatters to infinity. Uh, and of course, if photons do this, high frequency gravitons too. So you can also think about this region as, you know, the responsible for the late time behavior of compact space times. So if you throw stuff there, what you're going to, if you wait long enough, at late times, what you're going to be getting are photons that got trapped into the light ring. Okay, and people call these sometimes quasi-normal uh, ringing, the ring down of your space time. It also happens that the light ring, in addition to, to this dynamical relaxation of space times, is also responsible for the appearance of black holes. So if you look at an image by the Event Horizon Telescope or anything else that can look at black holes, uh, then the photon sphere actually also dictates the size of the region that you're going to be looking at. Black holes are black. So the dark region that you see has nothing to do with horizons, okay? You're, you're totally off horizons. Now, if you continue moving inwards, and you have angular momentum in your space time, you're going to reach a region called the uh, static limit or the ergo region where everything needs to co rotate with your space time. So, if you have a, a very powerful space rocket, you can remain at rest, you turn the engines on, and you can remain at rest with respect to far away observers. If you're far away from, the, from your black hole, but if you're within the ergo region, you cannot do this. You're forced to co-rotate with the space-time. And, uh, and of course, you, you can also find re ways to extract energy using this property. I'm not going to be dealing too much on this, uh, but anyway. And finally, if you have a black hole space-time and you continue moving inwards, you'll see the, uh, a one-way membrane, the horizon, okay? So I would like to dissect a bit of this in the, uh, and please interrupt me, let's make this a conversation, but I would like to understand if we can test these properties and what happens if horizons are not there or if there are transient properties, okay? If, you're, if you have bouncing space times that don't, that never make it to form a true black hole, a true eternal black hole. So the fundamental questions that you can ask for this meeting, for this discussion, 
is, are we looking at black holes? Are we looking at current black holes? How do we go around and, and, and quantify this? And what happens if you have horizons that disappear? I don't know if you have a, a primordial black hole that evaporates through Hawking radiation, or you have a, a stellar size collapse that's, that for some reason is halted and then bounces back to Minkowski again. And finally, what if horizons are not there at all? Okay. So how do we do this? How do we convince ourselves that we, we know well how to test these properties? What are the, the observational consequences of this physics? Now there's, I think, a bunch of ways to test uh, the Kerr paradigm to basically to understand if what we have is consistent with having a curved black hole in classical general relativity. I'm going to focus on one of the tests that I'm going to call spectroscopy, okay? And the idea is very simple. You take, a, uh, you take two objects, two very compact objects, and you let them collide, okay? Now, there's a variety of ways you can collide these two objects. I'm going, it doesn't really matter anyway. I'm just going to look at the final state, okay? And the final state, if we believe and you should believe the uniqueness uh, result that it has to belong to the Kerr family, and then at late times, you're looking at the a Kerr geometry over here, okay? So the idea is the following. You go backwards in time, and you try to understand what happens sufficiently close to the, to, but to the past of this guy, okay? Now, if the, if the end state is a Kerr black hole, then as you move backwards in time, you should find something that resembles a, a, a curved black hole, but slightly disturbed. That's the idea, right? So, so you take the field equations and you linearize them against the curved background. It's a very simple thing. Now, when you do this and you throw away uh, second and higher order terms in the field equations, then you're going to find that the, uh, your problem is described by a wave equation, a wave-like equation that looks like this, okay? Psi encodes either curvature components or a combination of, of metric components. It's a gauge invariant thing, okay? And there's a source term that either describes what, what exactly is doing the fluctuation, the, what, what exactly is causing the R curve block to be disturbed, or you can also think as a, of the source term as some initial data. I think it's equivalent ways of saying the same thing, okay? Now, this problem is well known, so, well, we can solve it, okay? Uh, it's a linear problem. So one way to go around this is really just to do a Laplace or a Fourier transform and reduce this form of the equation to something that looks like this, to a resolvent, okay? And we know, I mean, this is really well known, and we know that there's poles of that Green's function, so characteristic frequencies of, of that problem that dictate the late time behavior of your, of your solution, okay? So if you think about in terms of a Laplace transform and then do the inverse uh, problem, then you're going to see that the poles really give you an exponential decay, okay? And they're responsible really for the late time response of your problem. But, but now the difference with respect, say, to a conservative system like, a, I don't know, a string fixed at the ends, the difference is that a black hole space-time is really intrinsically a dissipative system, right? There's no way you can prevent waves from reaching uh, null infinity or from falling down the horizon. Okay, so in practice, what this means is when you try to solve the problem for the characteristic frequencies omega, you're going to find that they lie on the uh, complex plane. They have an imaginary part, okay? And therefore, when you plug that in, when you, do, when you try to do the inverse, this means that the solution of your problem behaves like this. Your, your metric quantities or your waveform, if you wish, your gravitational signal decays exponentially in time, but it also has a, 
a characteristic frequency f. It would. It's exactly the same thing. In this seater, in this seater, it's exactly the same thing, except that there's a new family. So I'm labeling. So the seater has nothing to it, right? There's another cosmological horizon that actually is responsible for making your 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 damping even more stronger. In anti the seater. Even that, yeah. no, they don't come back. No, no. Yeah, they are. Even if, yeah. So, so let me let me try to rephrase that. The question is if if black holes in this theater space time in cosmological space times behave differently. Yeah, but the seater space time has a cosmological horizon, and that's your observer should be located between the event horizon of, of the black hole and the cosmological horizon. You might be away, but I don't think that's proper physics away from this region. If you're in this region, then you're going to get damping on the event horizon and on the cosmological horizon. So the solution to your problem is exactly of the, of the same type. You, you could ask, what if I place a black hole in a box? Anti the seater, then you still have damping because waves are still absorbed by the horizon, by the event horizon. So even then, the problem is very similar. Okay. So we usually, is there any other question? Yeah. Okay, that's a good question. Yeah, you might, okay. I'm not going there. There are special examples where the waves might not get damped because if you have, Okay, if, if your black hole is spinning and it's placed in a box, then there's a, a phenomenon related to the ergo region that might prevent waves from being absorbed at the horizon. And it actually gives rise to an instability. Yes, thank you, Enrico, for contradicting me. <laughs> okay, so we label the solutions. It's really like the hydrogen atom, right? We take these frequencies omega. They are going to depend on the angular numbers, because we're separating angles here, angular quantum number L and azimuthal number M. And then for each of these, there's a tower of solutions that we label with the overtone N. Okay. So I divided the complex frequency in a, a, a time scale tau and the frequency F. And just for reference, if you have a 10 solar mass black hole, then the lowest, of the, the longest lived mode of these of, of these solutions has a frequency of roughly one kilohertz. This the stuff that LIGO measures, right? And the damping time scale of zero point five milliseconds. Okay. Yeah. This is for. So this is for a non-spinning black hole. If, if you add spin for re any reasonable spin, the numbers change by a factor two or three, not more. If you start adding extremal black holes, it is true, the damping can go to zero, but extremal black holes don't exist in the universe. We're always bound by the foreign limit, 0 0.998. And for that limit, you're going to get numbers similar to this. So we're still fine. Of course, theoretically, you can get very different numbers. This, I have a postdoc that likes to impress on me how surprising this is, Gregorio Carullo. Uh, he says, look, Florence is the size of a 10 solar mass black hole, and it's like kicking Florence and Florence relaxing on 0 0.5 milliseconds. Isn't that amazing? You know, it is amazing. It is amazing because it relaxes uh, due to things that travel at the speed of light. Gravitational waves travel at the speed of light. So I think it is an amazing statement. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> now, so so I, I, I tried to convince you that the uh, late time behavior uh, of, this, of the solution of this linear problem 
okay? It's an exponentially damped sinusoid. But this doesn't mean that if you actually have a detector that's going to be sitting somewhere and receiving the signal, it doesn't mean that it's only going to get a pure ring down mode, okay? And there's different reasons. And let me tell you why in general terms this is so. So if, if you have a detector somewhere here and you have a source like a star or a small black hole that's falling onto this massive guy, then your, your response is actually, you can actually think of it as a superposition of different things, okay? The first is a direct response that travels on the light cone, something that travels from source to detector. I'm calling this the prompt response, okay? Now, the prompt response depends on the initial data, okay? So if you have initial data that extends spatially, you're, all, you're going to continue receiving the prompt response even at late times, okay? But there's a fraction of the signal that's going towards the black hole. It's going towards the black hole and it can get trapped by the light ring, okay? So you see, usually, but not always, when you stop the initial data, you just make the source disappear. At late times, well, at late times, you're going to see photons that were lost close to the light ring and eventually reach the observer, okay? But not only those, there's also photons that were trying to make it to infinity, but they get backscattered by space-time curvature. Actually, mathematically, that's because there's a branch cut, sorry. There's a branch cut in this solution, okay? So it's a, a zero frequency response that gives you a late time tail, this backscattering, okay? So this makes the problem highly non-trivial from a data analysis point of view. It's not that you can get your signal and just fit it to, an exponent, to a sum of exponentially damped sinusoids, but it's still interesting. And in fact, the first LIGO observations did exactly this. So they took the fact that we think that the late time response is well described by an exponentially damped sinusoid, and they tried to test uh, that statement, okay? So the test was beautiful, I think, and it's the following. You first take your two compact objects, we see them before they, they merge, okay? We look at the gravitational wave signal, and we try to estimate the masses of the objects that are there. In fact, they, they look at the full signal, okay? And from there, you get some distribution for the masses and spins of your objects. And that from masses and spins, of course, you get these frequencies, okay? We know the frequencies to 20 decimal places. It's an amazing thing that I don't think anybody needs it for, but uh, we know them. So here's the numbers, okay? Black solid line is 90% posterior distribution for what we think the frequencies should be. Now, what we need to do is really just take the signal and fit it to an exponentially damped sinusoid. And if you try to do that, if you ever try to do that, let me go back to the signal. The first thing that will occur to you is, well, what the heck? Where do I start the fitting? You know, when exactly is this an exponentially damped sinusoid? Well, so you'll do what you can do, which is start fitting starting at different times. And the answer will depend on the starting time. And here you go. If you, if you try to fit too early, then it's really not a linear regime and it's probably not a pure sinusoid anyway. Okay? Yes, Remy? Yeah, yeah. What do you mean that it's linear? So 5% does mean much, right? Five well, you're saying 5% of the center of mass energy is emitted in the process, right? Yeah, 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 but, yeah, but with that argument, then the entire signal will be a linear thing and it can't be, it will be a ring down and it can't be. So you see, clearly when you're here, 
the, the objects haven't even coalesced. You really just have two guys. No, you can't. I mean, if you could do quasi normal ring down the final state here, you wouldn't get any of this. You cannot, you cannot. But, but, but let me continue. Yeah, we can, we can discuss this uh, afterwards. Well, I, actually, I'm, I'm super delayed. Let me, let me go quickly, okay? So the answer depends on where exactly you start feeding. If you start feeding too early, so one millisecond after the peak, you, you're just off, but you see things do improve. You, you get a, a relatively large error, but you have to realize this is the first spectroscopy test of black hole physics. It's an amazing thing. If you think about it, we're using gravitational waves to test the black hole property of the final state. Okay. And this is with a signal to noise ratio of roughly seven. A few years from now, when you get signal to noise ratios of 40, this is the kind of thing you're going to be looking at. Okay. You're going to be measuring the, the dominant mode. It's here. You barely see it. The area is so small. Okay. The quadrupolar mode. And you're going to be measuring the octopolar mode. This signal to noise ratio of 40. Now, Lisa is going to be doing signal to noise ratios of thousands. I can't even draw that. Okay. So I think the future is really, really interesting. Now, let me just add a couple of actually three items very quickly, hopefully one minute per item. It was thought. So when we linearize this, we lose a lot of physics. Okay. You're throwing second and higher order information that the field equations contain, okay? And it was thought just from numerical relativity simulations that the signal is purely linear. It's so amazingly simple that it seems something in the space, in black hole space times is filtering off all the nonlinearities, okay? I, and that's a statement I've heard throughout my entire life, okay? Now, it's a wrong statement. And in, uh, we and several other groups show that uh, in the past few months, that if you look carefully into, the, into numerical relativity simulations, you're going to find that there are imprints of nonlinearities there, okay? And the reasoning, the way you do this is really simple, okay? So at first order, you have a wave equation that looks like this with symbols one here, no source. Okay, if you expand the field equations to second order, then you're going to find the left hand side is still a wave like equation that's sourced by the first order guys. Okay, now if you think, next, if you think about ring down, the first order guys during ring down are just an exponentially damped sinusoid. Okay, so this means that the second order guys should contain, if they exist, should contain the square of this, okay? So this means twice the frequency and twice the damping time. And they should scale with the square of this, okay? So I'm not going to give you the details, but we find, I think, really strong evidence that they're there and they're nonlinear in nature. And, and one way to, to do that is to take two black holes and start colliding them at higher and higher center of mass energies. So you, you increase the first order guys and you should increase the second order guys quadratically. And that's shown here. This is the amplitude of the second order mode that we claim that we see as a function of the amplitude of the first order mode. It's a beautiful quadratic line. Sorry, sorry. In, numeric, in numerical relativity simulations, yes. We see this. You have to be, so you need to feed very carefully for all the modes that are there. So you start with first order modes, you clean the signal of first order modes, and what you get, you need to feed for possible second order guys. This is the way we do it. We see clear ev evidence for this. The amplitude is very small, yeah. Uh, 1% or so. It's not that tiny. 
If it were too tiny, numerical relativity errors would basically sweep it under. We wouldn't see it. It can't be too tiny. I think I, I, I don't want to lie. I think the magnitude of the correction is 1%, 5% or so relative to the first order modes. Yeah, yeah, in fact, yeah, this is the amp. So, thank you. <laughs> this is the amplitude of the second order mode as a function. Yeah, you see, it's up to 10% at. Re sorry, sorry. No, 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 sorry. The label it means the mode 200 times 200. Yeah, it's a quadratic mode, yeah. It depends on what you want to compare. So relative to the 200 mode, these are the numbers. Relative to the 400 mode, uh, so the 400, it's still weaker than the 400 mode. The 440, yeah, yeah. It's still weaker than the 440. Uh, 440, sorry, sorry, there is no 440. This is an axis symmetric collision. So it's a 400. Yeah, so there's a 400 mode. I think it's a factor two or so within the amplitude. It's not that tiny. I do not know. Yeah, that's one of the things we're trying to understand. Yeah, yeah. That's one of the things we're trying to understand now. Yeah. Also, the deep, so second order perturbation theory is rather well developed now. And one of the things that we understood, well, it's a trivial thing that we understood, but anyway, is that the amplitude of these guys should be a universal number. Okay, the amplitude of modes that are sourced. Well, some of these numbers are universal quantities. They should not depend on the initial conditions. And so you can extract them with, with tools that give you directly the second order. But let me, let me continue. Anyway, we can discuss this afterwards. Now, the second point I would like to add is about spectral stability. We calculated the spectrum of black holes but nothing guarantees, so we do vacuum. We assume that black holes in the space in our universe are, belong to the Kerr family. We calculate the spectrum and that's it. But of course, black holes live in galaxies. These live in clusters of galaxies and these live in an expanding universe. So how sure are we that the numbers we calculate are actually those that LIGO is measuring? Are these numbers even stable? when you do small fluctuations to the problem. And one of the things you can do to address this is to go to your first order guy, let me go back here. Oop. Now, this potential V tells you basically your background space time, your curve uh, geometry. So one of the things you can do is to slightly disturb V. For example, you add some star is out there in the universe and it's going to produce a small change in your potential V, okay? Now, let me try to tell you what happens when you do this exercise. So what we did was really simple. We took our potential, by the way, the potential has structure close to the photon sphere, close to the light ring, okay? This, this is the undisturbed potential, this radial coordinate, and this is amplitude of your effective potential. So what we did was we added an artificial bump in the potential with some amplitude epsilon is really small. You can't even spot it, okay? And it's supposed to mimic, I don't know, anything you want, a person, an astronaut close to the black hole, whatever you want, something. We don't really know what's causing that. But the idea is to redo the calculation and to calculate again the spectrum of this effective potential, okay? When epsilon goes to zero. And I'm placing the bump 
a distance a, a sufficiently far away from the black hole because I hope that black holes are simple and isolated enough in the universe. Now, you get a surprising answer when you do this, okay? And the answer is here. So I fix epsilon to be 10 to minus three. You can do 10 to minus six. You can do 10 to minus 20. Really small epsilon. And you start changing A, the distance at which the bump is located, okay? And this diagram here tells you how the real part of the frequency, so the vibration frequency, and the, the inverse of the damping time scale on the y-axis change when you do this. And you see, we, you start with a pure vacuum case, and as you change, the, this is for epsilon 10 to minus three, as you change A, your numbers go down, they go crazy. Isn't this, this amazing? You place an arbitrarily small bump in your effective potential, and you change completely your problem. The, the quasi-normal frequencies, these characteristic frequencies, change, change completely. This problem is known in quantum mechanics as the elephant and the flea problem. Because you have a big elephant, which is a supermassive black hole, you add a small flea there, and you know, the elephant is not enjoying the thing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so thank you, Enrico, for disclosing what I'm going to say in the next slide. Yeah. <laughs> so I think there's two lessons here to be learned. The first is you need to be really careful about characteristic frequencies, okay? They tell you what, Jesus Christ, I went halfway through what I wanted to say. No, it's fine. But so they tell you, the very late time behavior of your the dynamics of your problem, but they don't tell you about the transient properties of your problem. Okay, so if you're interested in knowing everything about the very late time behavior, then look at the characteristic frequencies. But what exactly is going on here? So, so if you do a time domain evolution, this is what you're going to find in that potential with a bump. So this is your gravitational wave amplitude as a function of time for a bump located at A equals 10 or 30, okay? And for different epsilon. So epsilon zero is a pure black hole problem. And the, the, the lower panels is really the difference between the vacuum and a potential with a bump, okay? And what you see is something, well, obvious, but at the same time surprising, which is at early times, the response is the same, okay? The response is the same. At late times, well, when you add an epsilon, you see the signal changes radically. It's longer lived, and this is why the spectrum was totally different. The spectrum always describes late time phenomena, this region over here or this over here. It so happens by coincidence, that the quasi-normal modes of black holes really describe everything because the potential is so simple. If you start adding matter or bumps in the potential, then characteristic frequencies don't tell you anything about what LIGO is measuring. Those are light ring modes. They are not in the spectrum, okay? Now, this was my item two. My item three is related to this. We need to understand environmental effects way, way better. It's not enough to add a bump in the potential. We need to understand if galaxies or clusters of galaxies or stars or other binaries change wave propagation and generation and in, it, in which way they do that. I don't have time to discuss all I wanted, but then let me discuss a little bit what happens when horizons die, okay? I won't kill them completely, that was the third part, but let me talk about the second part. So what happens if you have transient horizons? Let me tell you one example that's popular these days, but really it's been a subject of work for decades. The idea is to try and have something collapsing, but at some point you halt the collapse in some way, okay? One possible example was built by Hayward many years ago, okay? The idea is simple. You, you 
ascribe a mass, you, 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 if you think about the Vidya like space time, okay, you place some mass in your space time that grows. You, at some point, you form horizons, and then you just prescribe some mechanism that makes your solution flat again. Okay, so your profile for the mass looks something like this, this retarded coordinate. Okay, so I think at the time Hayward was interested in building something that's regular, right? And his way to regularize the space time was to introduce some param parameter L, small l, that's supposed to be of the Planck scale uh, size, but it doesn't really matter, okay? Anything will do. The idea is really just to prevent this from being singular at the origin, okay? Now, if you look at the properties of the solution, you will find that there's an outer horizon at two times M0, M0 is this value over here, okay? And, and, you, and you know, we could be living and seeing these space times as long as this horizon lifetime is sufficiently long, okay? So there's an outer horizon at two M0, but there's also an inner horizon at L or roughly L if L is much smaller than M0. And you can show there always needs to have to be an inner horizon in addition to the outer one. This is important, okay? <laughs> Are there questions about the, uh, the space-time construct? It's really as simple as you can get. Yeah? So, so thank you. This model, in fact, was supposed to, to be a construction of the Penrose diagram of an evaporating black hole. So you can think of this space-time as, a, as something that you want to mimic for an evaporating black hole, okay? Of course it has to, so by the way, of course it has to violate energy conditions. Quantum matter, wait, 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 quantum matter violates energy conditions, okay? It doesn't violate energy conservation. And in fact, Hayward, what it does is throwing negative energy states onto this space time. So it's, there's no violation. I'm, we can discuss this afterwards, okay? Let me just tell you what happens. Okay. Now, if you start looking at geodesics in this space time, you'll find the first amazing thing. These are geodesics that were of photons that were trapped when this guy collapsed, okay? There was some photon traveling in the space time. It's trapped when the matter collapses. It forms an horizon. It's stuck there. But at some point, the horizon disappears and the photon travels to outside observers, okay? Now, if you think about Cauchy, there's no Cauchy horizon in this space time. There's an inner horizon, but the Penrose diagram, it's totally different from that of a spinning black hole. There's no Cauchy horizons, okay? But if you think about Cauchy horizons, there's an instability that was due to focusing of geodesics. And something similar happens here. So if you start throwing, seeing how geodesics behave, you will find and look at the energy of these geodesics. Because it's a dynamical space time, a photon can gain an, a, a huge amount of energy, okay? This here shows you the energy amplification, the energy gain of a photon as it exits the space time when it becomes a synthetically flat. Okay, and what you see is that photons that do not probe the inner horizon, this is the inner horizon location, okay? Photons that really just are stuck close to the external guy, to the outer horizon, they are not amplified. They do nothing special, okay? The horizon disappears, they just travel. But photons that happen to probe the inner horizon, they can be amplified to basically whatever you want. Okay, in fact, you can bound the amplification factor to be like this. You can amplify the energy of a photon or a graviton by E to the horizon lifetime over L, okay? This is a geodesic analysis. You can do the same thing just doing waves. You throw a gravitational wave there and this is what happens, okay? Let me do the exercise. 
I throw a gravitational wave, this pulse over here, in this spacetime. So at this point, you have an inner horizon and an outer horizon. You're looking at time progressing. Let me show this again because it's interesting. Very good. Time is progressing. This is the mass function over here. This is the amplitude of your scalar, okay? Now you form horizon. You see the blue shift of radiation close to the inner horizon. Now it disappeared. The space-time bounced back and you're left with a highly blue shifted radiation, okay? So if you think on applying this to evaporating blackles, so you take a 10 to the 14 gram primordial blackle that's evaporating on a Hubble time scale, then you'll find that the amplification factor is of the order e to the 10 to the 61. It's, uh, you know, it's monstrous. Of course, you need to back react on this. So horizons that die young should be giving you huge energy outputs in your spacetime. Okay. Now, unfortunately, I don't have time to talk about horizons that never make it, but feel free to ask me questions. I'll stop here. Thank you. for your very interesting talk. Are there any questions? So, so one again about the nonlinearities. Uh, so from, from your papers, I understood, for example, in the merging case, the black hole merger case, the uh, quasi-circular, that the, yeah. the amplitude of the nonlinear mode, the 2 to 0 plus 2 to 0, was comparable to the 4 4 0. But anyway, even regardless, so I wanted to ask you whether this is true, but even regardless this, do I understand correctly that uh, suppose that we, we do the observation and we measure a different uh, L equal M equal four mode than what predicted by GR, these results sort of put a limit on the quality of beyond GR tests that we can do because we will never know whether that is beyond GR effect or a nonlinear. No, I, I think so. Okay, the question is, uh, first of all, if the uh, nonlinear mode uh, is of the same order as the uh, higher multiple mode amplitude, and that is true, not only for quasi-circular, but also for the head-on high energy collisions with it, is of this, I don't know the number, it's a factor of two or three, uh, within a factor of two or three. And the other question is, if, if this is a limit on the ability to test GR, and I, I, I go the opposite way, which is if you have a sufficiently large signal to noise ratio, then this is a further test on general relativity on the nonlinear content of general relativity. Of course, if it happens that you have an alternative theory of gravity that predicts a mode to be precisely what that nonlinear mode is, then you're stuck with that, that you have to live with that fact. But most of the theories, well, I don't know if most of the theories, I think there's a, uh, a wide range of theories that would predict an extra mode away from where the nonlinear mode is, and therefore everything is open. Yeah, I don't think that's a limit. Interpret your question and tell me if. Uh, Reinterpret. So the thing is that there is some limited accuracy by which the measurements are done, and some limited accuracy by which the calculations are done. Yeah. Right. And so yeah. if you are pushed into higher order calculation and and you need more precision in the measurement. Of course, even to so tell yeah. Sense, yeah, okay, yeah. So the question is your ability yeah. to yeah. Of course, of course. I mean if you want to test new physics. Agree, uh, uh, this is uh, I mean that's always the case. Yeah. yeah, that's always the case. If you want to it, it, you don't even need to test GR with that. If you just want to probe the nonlinear content, of course you need to have higher signal to noise ratios. Whenever you want to test some new thing, you need to increase the precision of your instrument. You know, and I don't think you can get away from that. Other questions? Yeah, I can repeat. Okay. Yeah. What is the nonlinearity effects? Yeah, yeah. We do not. So the question is, how do nonlinearities affect the start of the ring down? 
I don't think we know, and I don't think there's an answer to that question in the sense that there is no start of ring down. I mean, the, the entire uh, point of this slide was to say that there is no ring down start. You know, when, whenever you start the source in a black hole space time, like this planet over here, then ring down is always there because there's always gravitons and photons that are orbiting the light ring. So in that sense, at all times, the response has ring down. Okay, and at all times, there's nonlinear contributions and tail con these backscatter contributions. So I really think you're, st so we are of course probing now nonlinearities, we're trying to probe the backscatter and so on, but I think you need to live with the fact that in the full response is only available in numerical relativity simulations. We're trying to do the best we can by separating this into responses, but of course it's, it's far from ideal, right? It's a, it's a, it's a second best way of doing things, I would say. Yes. I do not know. That's a good question. I do not know. But I can rephrase that. So in this particular bump, we would need to calculate it. It's spherically symmetric, but you can make it uh, asymmetric. And we did the exercise with Enrico and Paolo uh, eight years ago of adding a shell of matter, okay? And then fix, either fixing the mass of the shell and just placing it farther away, okay? Or actually decreasing the mass of the shell and placing it farther away. In both cases, the change to the characteristic frequencies uh, scales exponentially with the distance at which you place it far away. It doesn't matter how small the mass in the shell is, if it's sufficiently far, then the change to the characteristic frequency is going to be really, really different. So it's going to be big. And, and if you think about quantum mechanical you know, perturbation theory, the reason is that the, 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 the zeroth order states, they, de they depend exponentially on the location of your shell. These modes, the quasi normal modes, uh, depend exponentially on the, on the radial location. So that's the reason. But, but again, I want to emphasize that we're fine from a time evolution point of view. At early times, LIGO is happy and should be continuing to see what it sees. It's only, it only affects the response at late times. 